We want to thank you all for coming out to the program this evening. And we want to thank our generous sponsor, University Federal Credit Union, who supports the program Science Study Break um, and makes possible the wonderful programming that we put on here and also the refreshments that you're all enjoying. So big hand for UFCU. programs, for example, we've looked at the biology in the movie Avatar, we had uh, a program where they looked at zombie epidemiology around Halloween a couple of years ago. Uh, many of these programs were recorded and are available uh, on the Science Study Break section of the UT Austin YouTube page. So please check them out. Also, if you would like to suggest a TV show, a movie, a topic, or a presenter for a future Science Study Break treatment, please leave your suggestions on the feedback form. If you don't have a form right now, um, there are people who will be passing out the feedback forms. It's a little half sheet. Go ahead and fill it out. We've got some golf pencils if you don't have a, a, an implement so that you can fill it out and leave that behind for us so that we can use that for future programming. I can tell you that Sherlock Holmes is one of the most requested programs uh, that we've had in the several years of Science Study Break, and so I'm so happy that we're finally getting to do this in this evening. So, your suggestions will not go unheard, so please leave them for us. Um, if you are following us on Twitter, we're at Sci Study Break or at UTLSL. You can follow Life Science Library on Facebook, and if you're tweeting this event, the hashtag is SSB Sherlock. Also, you might have noticed that there are all sorts of recycling containers all around the building, both inside and out, so please use the containers for your cans. Please, no cans in the trash. Thanks for your, for your cooperation. It takes a village of people to put on a science study break, and here are some of the folks who make it happen for us. So, big hand for all the people unseen whose efforts made this program. And remember, it's brought to you by the UT Libraries. We have great resources and great people here to help you all the time. So let's get right to it. There's plenty of content here, so let me first introduce Dr. James Bryant, who has a B.Sci. from the University of the West of England and a Ph.D. from UT Southwestern Medical Center. He's been a lecturer in the biology department since 2005, teaching classes in biostatistics and immunology. His research interests include embryonic stem cell models, assessing 3D structures with stereological techniques, mouse knockout technologies, and the bright transcription factor. He is a PADI dive master and a campanologist. Next, we have Dr. Sam Gosling, who has a BA from the University of Leeds and a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. He's been in the psychology department since 1999 teaching classes in introductory psychology and personality assessment. He's an associate editor of the Journal of Individual Differences and Personality and Social Psychology Science. His research interests include fundamental issues in impression formation, how research on animals can inform theories of personality and social psychology, and using empirical indices to track trends in the history of psychology. He's the author of the book Snoop, What Your Stuff Says About You, and now please welcome to tell us all about the statistics and observations of personality used by Master Sleuth Sherlock Holmes. Pre please welcome Dr. Jim Bryant and Dr. Sam Gosling. Two, hello, okay, very good, it's working. Hello, they got to, they, this is Sherlock Holmes, they got to two English people to uh, talk about it, because obviously we know a lot about Sherlock Holmes, because we're English. Technically British. British, sorry. There we go. Um, OK, uh, so anyway, so how we thought we'd do it is we are going to, uh, uh, Jim's going to talk first about uh, uh, some stuff for about 20 minutes, and then I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then uh, we would like to open it up, because we, think, we both think it would be much more kind of uh, interesting to make this more into a, some kind of discussion format so you can, uh, we can address your questions. Um, I beg your pardon. <laughs> We're going to move the mic down into the, into the middle of the aisle there, so when you do have questions, please come to the mic. Yeah, what she Thanks. said. All right. Gives me great pleasure. <laughs> Over to you, Jim. Hit it. Okay, so what I thought we would do first is we'd talk about Sherlock Holmes and how we use critical thinking and statistics um, to reason 
back or forwards to the perpetrator of crimes. So my name's James Brandt, and this is Sam Gosling. Oops. So first I thought I'd give you a little introduction to Sherlock Holmes's little routine. So let's see if we can get this to work. Okay, so that was Sherlock Holmes, and that was the first meeting with Sherlock Holmes with Dr. Watson. Sherlock Holmes is accredited with being able to make, from small observations, very big inferences. Um, so what we'll do is we'll talk about basically the mechanism of how he does that. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was the author of Sherlock Holmes. He was born in 1859, died in 1930, born in Edinburgh, studied medicine in the University of Edinburgh, authored a lot of fiction books in addition to Sherlock Holmes and quite a number of non-fiction um, he conceived Sherlock Holmes, who was first published in 1887. He killed off Holmes in 1893 due to he, he pretty much wanted to publish other things and write other stories, and he felt very constrained by writing about Sherlock Holmes. Over the next eight years, there was a lot of public opinion and demonstration ag against him, and he then actually ended up bringing Sherlock Holmes back um, in 1901 in The Return of Holmes. So the real Sherlock Holmes that was accredited by... Um, Conan Doyle was actually Dr. Joseph Bell. He was accredited by Don Conan Doyle, as we said. He was born in 1837, died in 1911. He was a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh at the time that um, Conan Doyle was studying there and studying his medical degree. He was actually a pioneer forensic scientist. He actually was a real-life criminologist in the 19th century, and he em emphasized the key of observation. If you can't observe it, there's no way you're going to understand it. So he pr proposed observation and questioning for diagnosis in the medical field. Sherlock Holmes was classified as one of the world's best-known fictitious detectives. He featured in the Strand magazine and Libercop's monthly magazine in 1887. He's characterized as the world's only consulting detective. He employed impartial observations, so he collected information without bias, and then he evaluated the information either abductively or deductively. Deductively is once I've removed everything that could explain something, then whatever is left, it, however improbable, is the cause of the event. And abductive is if I collect a series of facts, I can piece them together into an understanding or a model of the world by basically creationism. Um, so he used these processes to make inferences, and in that case it was the solution of mysteries and identifying criminals. So he was basically using critical thinking, which is basically statistics. And there's a couple of branches of statistics we'll talk about later. So when do we need critical thinking? So first off, let's talk about what is critical thinking. It's the mental process of actively, skillfully collecting, summarizing, conceptualizing, which we would call descriptive statistics, analyzing, sensing, and evaluating, which we would call inferential statistics, information in order to reach a conclusion or an understanding about the real world. So when do we need it? If we were learning a new subject, we could structure how we learn to use critical thinking to make that learning process easier. We could answer exam questions. We could determine the appropriate answer. We can think of a lot of answers to questions, and usually it's the most, the most, if we have an ability to look at potential answers, we can then choose the best answer, and that's usually going to be the, the right answer. Um, writing a book, you have to organize, collect information, organize it, and then, so you've got to organize the plot, add in the character definition and stuff like that. So you can see, Basically, we're going to need critical thinking all the time, and especially in our lives when the chips are down. We want to critically think our way out of problems and have the best solution to those problems. So there are a number of steps to promote critical thinking. And so it, we, critical thinking isn't just something that happens in a vacuum. So to promote question, uh, critical thinking, the number one is to understand the world, we basically have to question. The times you don't question is probably going to be the time where that information is unreliable and you're going to make a mistake. So you want to question, 
Then you want to adopt this clean sheet of paper approach. What you want to do is you want to empty your mind of preconception, you want to empty your mind of what you think is going on, and then fill a piece of paper with conceptual steps. And that's not looking for an answer, that's looking for an understanding. There are steps of conceptualization are defined as definition, define the terms, um, draw, and that's things like schematics, figures, concept maps, and graphs to help you understand. And then redefine the question. What is really being asked in the question? And then you can then proceed to, um, if necessary, locate appropriate information. Most of our problem solving doesn't need additional information than, than what we probably bring to the table. If it was a bigger problem, we need to make a game plan. We might need to order reagents. If we were building a house, we might, we need, we might need a, a plan of the house. We might need the materials to pour the foundation, the materials for the, the roof and stuff like that. Then we have to execute the game plan and stick to the game plan. So we, in the case of most simple problem solving, let's restate the question as part of your answer. Then it's really, really, really state the absolute obvious and work from obvious to not quite so obvious. Most of us, when we problem solve, we tend to jump to a solution or jump to a statement, and we tend to overfocus on detail. And so we miss the connecting steps to link ideas together. And then finally, most of us are human, so most of us make a considerable amount of mistakes. So we want to evaluate, and we want to check and double check our answers before they leave our desk. <clears throat> so how do statistics work? How do critical thinking and statistics work? We ask questions in order to understand the world, and that works through three steps. We collect information. And we want to collect that information so that that information is impartial. It's not representing what we think is going on, but what is actually going on. Then we organize the information, and that pretty much is tidying up. And so pretty much tidying up everything in life is 80% of tidying up, and the rest of it is just a little bit of chucking things together. Uh, Thanksgiving meal, 80%, two hours preparing the meal, 20 minutes eating it, two hours cleaning up. So most of the world is tidying. Then we have to summarize the information. And Sherlock Holmes said, if you can't see it, you can't understand it. So we have to have some mechanisms of visually or summarizing the information so we can see what's going on. With a lot of information, it's, it's just too much for us to actually take in. So we have to have some structure to that. And then the very last step, which is really the most unimportant of the three steps, collection, the most important. Because if, you, if you, what you collect isn't representative of reality, it's never going to tell you about reality. If you can't summarize it, you can't understand your perception of that reality. And the last step is called inferential statistics. And that's basically, from what I've collected, how reliable it is. If I choose two people to describe the IQ of people in this room, I could choose the two wrong people. And then I could get an overestimate or an underestimate. If I add to my sample, I'm going to get a better estimate. So obviously, things like sample size are going to lead to an error. And I have to be able to measure my errors or imprecisions in my perceptions to be able to build up an accurate view of the world. <coughs> so let's see how Sherlock Holmes relates to all of those three steps. So sampling and observation. So a problem with simplicity. When I hear you give your reasons, said Watson, the things always appear to me to be so ridiculously simple that I could easily do it myself. Though at each successive instance, your reasoning, I am baffled until you explain the process. And yet I believe my eyes are as good as yours. And Holmes says, quite so. You see, but you do not observe. The distinction is clear. For example, you, you see the steps that lead up to this room, but you fail to observe or count them. So two points come out here. Sherlock, oh, sorry, Watson could easily make the same inferences and deductions that Sherlock Holmes does, yet he doesn't follow the process in order to achieve that uh, mastery. And then the process begins with observation. If you don't collect information, if you don't question the world, there's no way you're going to understand the world. So let's have a look at another, a couple of instances. Impartial observation. You don't seem to give much thought to the matter in hand, said Watson. No data yet, answered Holmes. It is a capital mistake to theorize before you have all of the evidence. It biases the judgment. And this was from a, stu a study in Scarlet. Um, let's flick over a moment for a little segment from Sherlock Holmes. Ooh. Give me your observations. Well, it's, it's unthinking about how this figment you're on address. Good reason why. Dear Mr. Holmes, there will call upon you tonight at a quarter to eight a gentleman who. Good heavens, we've only a few minutes, Holmes. Go on. 
a gentleman who desires to consult with you upon a matter of the very deepest moment. Your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe have shown that you are one who may be safely trusted with matters which are of an importance which can hardly be exaggerated. This account of you we have from all quarters received be in your chamber then. Good. Good heavens, this is a mystery indeed. What do you imagine it means? Well, I have no data yet. It is a count on the state of the earth as before and as later. Mm. So you can see here that um, a lot of people will respond to a little bit of information. That response could be erroneous, it could be over-responsive, under-responsive, and typically it can be emotional. But that response doesn't necessarily bring an understanding of reality or the ability to shape that reality in a favorable way. So biasing assumption. There's nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact, said Sherlock Holmes. And that's, a lot of times we think things are obvious, but that doesn't make them real. So we have, to, we have to collect impartial information and then evaluate it. Incorrect, incorrectly fitting observations to series. This is indeed a mystery, said Watson. What, can you, what um, do you imagine that this means? I have no data yet. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Uh, insensibly, one begins to twist the facts to suit theories instead of the theories to suit facts. And there's a lot of statements um, here that think people like the police will, they want to arrest someone but that doesn't mean that they're arresting the person who perpetrated the crime. And so a lot of times they will have a theory that this person committed a crime, and then they will look for facts to justify that theory instead of going from the other way and collecting information and see who did commit the crime. So how do we collect information impartially? There's a number of tools in statistics for us to do that. We can randomly select cases. What that means is if we were to choose people in this room to describe IQ or height or any characteristic, we would label people and then we would pull from a random number generator numbers that would correspond to people who are going to be in the sample. And that ensures that every case in the population has the same chance as being selected. So that removes me as the observer from who is going to be in the observation or the sample. Then we can do things like double blind studies. These are the gold standard for drug testing and things like that. So in double blind study, the patient doesn't know what treatment they're receiving and the subject, uh, sorry, the patient doesn't know the treatment and the doctor doesn't know the treatment. That insulates the information from things called placebo and nocebo effects. If I give you a pill and you think that's gonna make you smarter and, it, and you say it makes me smarter, that's a placebo effect, a positive effect. If I give you a pill and say that's gonna make you dumber and then you think you're dumber, that's a nocebo effect, that's a negative effect. It, these effects, although subtle, are very powerful. If we compare placebo effect to untreated, if I give you a pill and say this works and you believe it works compared to untreated, you can get response rates between 30 and 60% based on your faith and belief system. And that, that can be manifest not just as a psychological be belief, but as a physical manifestation. For instance, things like hypnosis. If I was to put a copper coin on some people and to hypnotize them that believe that they were allergic, they could actually mount an allergic reaction. So psychological belief can be incredibly powerful and influential, not just in a psychological realm, but in a physical realm. If we put that into the context of drugs, most drugs that are on the market work 30 to 60% better than placebo. Placebo works 30 to 60% better than not treatment. So you can see the benefit of the drug compared to placebo is comparable to the placebo compared to untreated. So placebo effects or belief of the experimenter can be highly influential, and belief of the experiment E can be highly influential. So we have to insulate information from these preconceptions. Then the other thing is things like blocking and stratification. If we believe, if we treat with a drug that there's an, uh, the drug affects age groups differently or genders differently, we can, it, we can stratify the data so that we can compare control to treatment of same age. And so that's stratification to remove um, extraneous variables. And those all help us to have impartial observation and, and to have an ability to collect data that is going to represent reality and not some sort of other variable or other explanation or a preconception or a bias. So the other part of um, uh, statistics is descriptive statistics. And Sherlock Holmes said, I see it, I deduce, to deduce it. And this was from a scandal in Bohemia. Another part of uh, statistics was uh, conceptualization. It, Holmes underwent frequency, uh, frequency analysis in the adventure of the dancing men. There were all these little characters of dancing men drawn um, on, on flower pots and things like that from one of the characters in the plot. 
And these were, um, it was a cryptography. And so he did an analysis. He drew out all of these um, characters. And then he, he made an analysis based on the frequency of the characters to which letter of the alphabet these represented. So basically, he's taking information and he's doing some way of visualizing or summarizing information in order to have a handle on it. So there are various steps of visualizing information. It's essential to see, visualization is essential to see and understand information. It is 90% of the process of correctly understanding the world. It's, it's a big, big chunk. We don't need complicated things in order to understand the world. Graphs and tables get us most of the way. So graphs, these are picture paints a thousand words, and they are qualitative representations of information. So they summarize information pictorially and then they're not truly quantitative. Tables of summary indexes like means, standard deviations, and medians, these are quantitative representations of information. So if we give a table and a graph together, we can see visually what's kind of happening in the rough direction, and then we can supplement it with quantitative values of how much is happening. So let's have a little exercise. Beating, uh, beating cancer. Survival rates of five years of cancer range from 10% to 90%. Here we have various types of cancers, ranging from thyroid cancer to pancreatic cancer. <laughs> Obviously, what's your view if, you're, if you go to the doctor and you're told you have cancer, what's your first thing you're going to say? What type of cancer? So if we look at breast cancer and testicular cancer, your survival rate is pretty good. And then if we compare that to lung and brain cancer, the survival rate isn't that great. Why do you think there's a discrepancy? So now we visualize that we see a discrepancy. Try to visualize your, in your head, your body, and, and articulate why there is a discrepancy between um, the various types of cancers, um, testi uh, testicular, breast, compared to brain and lung. Go ahead. So the less vital organs have a higher survival rate, why? Right, so, so treatment. If, if you have a non-vital organ, breast and testes, although you guys might not like to lose them, they can be removed and you can survive. But brain and lung, any removal of those tissues is going to affect some sort of function. Even a cubic millimeter of brain tissue it could severely affect function. So that affects prognosis. What else? OK, so. We have later diagnoses in um, brain and um, lung cancer. Why? Why do you think it's later in those tissues compared to breast? Yeah. You can't look at them. You can't see them. Your brain's in a bony cavity. Same with your, your chest cavity is, is hiding your lungs and protecting those vital organs from damage. So by the time you realize, ooh, something's wrong, you're probably coughing up blood, you're probably dribbling blood from your ears or your nose if it was a brain, you're probably falling over, by which time the diagnosis is much later and the cancer is much more severe. Okay? The other thing that is, is also important, and this is not intuitively obvious, lung and brain don't have internal pain reception. They have reporting of stretch for, for the lung so you can breathe correctly, but there's no pain sense for the lung. Same thing for the brain. So you can have development without the body knowing itself that these, these tissues have a cancer state. In the case of breasts and testes, they're external, and you can palpate them and observe them. And then you can lead that itself to early diagnosis. So basically, the ability to observe gives you power and affects a change on the probability of being a recipient of a bad event. So observation and understanding is power. All right, so let's have another little go at it. What do you think the distribution of criminal tendency is looking like? If we plotted the frequency on the y-axis of criminal tendency against on the x-axis of how criminal you people are, what would it look like? What sort of shape would it be? What do you think about criminals? What do you think about yourselves? Are you all criminals? Or are you not criminals? Um, We're talking about, as we go this way on the, on the x-axis, we're getting more and more criminal. Anything. So, you know, low degree of criminal tendency, I steal erasers. High degree of criminal tendency, 
I'm sticking the pencil in your eyeball before I steal the eraser. <laughs> so how does criminal tendency, how do the numbers of people with criminal tendency change with severity of criminal tendency? You think it's a normal bell curve. So, so most people have an average degree, quite a high average degree of criminal tendency. Like, you know, I have degree, but I just mean that some people aren't criminal at all. Just, 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 or extremely criminal. And then everyone's kind of in the middle. So everyone's middling criminal. Uh, I'd say that there's probably a lot more minor criminals than there are. Right. So there's, there's, there's probably more low criminal tendency than high criminal tendency. And if we look at it, that's pretty much that we see. So we, we understood already criminal tendency, but if we didn't understand criminal tendency, what does this tell us? And there's a way to observe to understand. So what does this distribution tell us about criminal tendency? In order to do that, we want to observe what is factually in front of our face. So what would you say first off? Look at the graph and tell me what the graph tells you. As we go this way, criminal tendency is getting more extreme. So what do we say about criminal tendency? It's skewed, so there's a tail to the right. What else? Hugo? <laughs> what can you tell me? Anybody? So. You're telling me what you told me before. You observed there are more low criminal people with low criminal tendency than high criminal tendency. So what does that tell us about the system of criminality? So we observe the distribution of criminal tendency is right skewed. It has a tail to the right. We observe from the data that low criminal tendency is more common than high criminal tendency. And therefore, from that, we would speculate that there must be a strong incentive not to be criminal. All right. What would we normally expect the distribution of something to be? What do you think? Bell-shaped. So if we perturb the bell shape to askew this way, so we've pushed the data this way, there must have been predominant factors to push criminal tendency down. And that's social pressure. It's not socially acceptable to be criminal. So there are social pressures and obviously tendencies towards it's simpler to be honest. So th those factors predominate over criminal tendency. OK, so the third part of statistics is inference. So let's talk about Sherlock Holmes and inference. Deduction and inference. On the contrary, Watson, you see everything. You fail, however, to reason from what you see. You are too timid in drawing your inferences, said Holmes. And we've got another little clip of this. So I think this is actually the clip. Oops. So what do you gather from that? Battered old felt. You know my methods. What do you yourself gather as to the individuality of the man who has worn this particular article? It was accompanied by a goose, Watson. For Mrs. Henry Baker, it was printed upon a small card attached to the bird's left leg. Well, apart from the initials inside, HB, presumably Henry Baker, I can see nothing. On the contrary, Watson, you can see everything. But you fail to reason from what you see. You are too timid in drawing your inferences. So Holmes then goes on to make quite an extensive um, critique of the owner of the hat. So he basically notes ob observations and then pieces those observations to describe the characteristics of the owner of the hat. So um, we have deductive or frequentist inference. There are two branches of inference. There's, there's frequentist, and Home typifies both of these. Once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how probable, improbable, must be the truth. So this is deductive reasoning. And then Holmes also practices a uh, process called Bayesian inference. But I have heard all that you've heard, you have heard, said Watson, without, however, the knowledge of pre-existing cases which serve me so well, said Holmes. So Holmes is using two types of inferential statistics to piece together his understanding of the world. And I think this is one of our last little clips. Let's have a quick look at this. We're obviously living in a suicide. That does seem to be the only explanation of all facts. Rob, it's one possible explanation of some facts. You've got a solution, like you're choosing to ignore anything you see that doesn't comply with it. 
Right. Which means on the right side of the spectrum. That includes the left hand. I was quite a bit of contortion. Left hand? Oh, maybe. Copy table on the left hand side, copy right hand, copy right hand. Copy the left hand side, copy the right hand. Copy the left hand. Power stop is positioned in the right hand. Turn the table on the left hand side of the phone. If you pick it up, it's right. If you have left, it's this left. If you go off, you don't think it's going to go on. I might want to put it in the bottom. If it's right, the red ball will be faster on the right side. So this was a demonstration of, um, I guess, more frequency statistics. He took all of the information. He built an abductive model of what was going on from observation. That model was counter to the model the police had, um, but however, it explained all of the observations and the facts. And in that case, this was, there was a tendency for misdirection by the criminal to, to pretend that this crime was actually a suicide when it wasn't. All right, so we talked just briefly, and I'm not going to go into detail about frequent statistics because this is where actually the math and number crunching comes in. So we have two types of uh, statistics. Frequentist, this is the statistics of impartiality. If your doctor was frequentist, you go to your doctor and he would test you for every disease under the sun, and then he would eventually diagnose you, but it could be quite slow. But he would always get there. This type of statistics was proposed by Fisher in 1935, and it was actually quite smart. What Fisher said is, we can't actually observe the real world. We can only observe a sampling of that real world, and that sample, by, nat by its nature, has to have imprecision or has to have error. So if we can determine whether that sample is due to er the differences in samples are due to error, we can't make an inference about the population because we can ascribe those differences in the sample to an error. However, if we can't ascribe differences in sample to error and we drew those samples from the population, they're telling us what's going on about reality. And so he focused this all on this principle of the null hypothesis, that there is no real difference and can I overcome a threshold of being able to explain the difference by sampling error. And if I can overcome that threshold that I can't explain the difference by sampling error, then there must have been a real error. Uh, sorry, a real observation. In the other type of inferential statistics called Bayesian statistics, this is where you would go to the doctor, you've got goop coming out of both ends, and he would, he would think, well, you've got either enteric, an enteric situation, either bacterial or viral. And then he would run a number of tests to see if it was bacterial or viral. If it's bacterial, he'd give you antibiotics, tell you to drink plenty and go home and suffer. If it was viral, he'd tell you to drink plenty and go home and suffer. So, but the problem with that is it could be very efficient. But say you had a cancer that was causing you to be nauseous and have diarrhea. He would, if it was out of his purview, out of his experience, he may never actually diagnose and you could die. So for a Bayesian statistics, it has this prior assumption. It can be incredibly efficient and get to the answer very, very quickly. But it, when it's wrong, it can be very wrong. Uh, frequentist is the statistics of impartiality. It, will, it could be pl plodding, but it will always get there in the end. And Bayes, uh, Bayesian statistics was proposed by the Reverend Thomas Bayes in 1763. So some of these conceptual ideas have been around for quite a while. So in summary, why are statistics so vital to our lives? It helps us to perceive complex information. It helps us to interpret information. It's one way, not the only way, but it's one important way of seeing the real world. It helps us to view and understand the gray world. The real world is not all good or bad. It's a degree of good and a degree of bad. So our world is gray, and statistics helps us to perceive and to understand and evaluate that. It helps us to put the gray world into a perspective that is reliable. It allows us to weigh up the costs and benefits of certain actions, and it provides us with choices. It provides us with ways to make those choices. Once we understand what's going on, once we can visualize, we can usually see solutions. And important choices are never easy. Statistics can provide an avenue to work things out and to improve our lives if we choose to use them. But if we don't learn them, we don't even have the choice to use them to enrich our lives. So that pretty much summarizes my little dis discussion of what is critical thinking and statistics. And now I want to open the floor up to Sam. Thanks. I don't, I don't think he's done. He's, he's, stay, he's hanging around. We're both, and I've told him to interrupt me if he uh, wants to do anything. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go over some stuff. Can I, is this, can I turn this stuff off and turn some lights on? Would that be possible? Because then I can stand here. 
Obviously, it's not possible. All right, okay. Okay, so um, I'm a psychologist, um, and what I do is I study um, how um, people leave traces of their personalities, their various characteristics in their spaces. So it's very much like what Holmes does um, in terms of trying to make inferences about people from snooping around the stuff. It's exactly what I do. Um, I am being blinded by that thing. Can, that, can, can you hit B? If you hit B, doesn't it turn it off? No. There you go. Very all right. I don't mind that. It's the light. So I wouldn't mind. Uh, okay. So who here, so who who here believes you can, if you were like for example to snoop around somebody's space, their bedroom, who believes that you can learn something about people? Raise your hand if you think you can. Right. Most of us do. That's very consistent with our research. Most people believe that after music preferences, uh, you can uh, the the next best place to learn about somebody is is essentially to look look around their space because uh, people uh, people's personalities is reflected in those spaces. Okay. So now, who believes you can do it like uh, Sherlock Holmes does, which is go in and say, oh, this means this, this means this, this means this. Who who, who believes you can do that? Yes, well, only one, is, and, it, and the truth is, it's much harder to do that. But many, many people do believe that's the case. So, um, and, and, and so, I mean, I do a little bit of consulting for uh, the uh, FBI, and the FBI, they believe that. They believe that you go into a place and you go, uh, you do much like Sherlock Holmes does. Oh, look, here's a bowler hat, and it's got, you know, a little, you know, worn around the rim, and all, all those sorts of things. And the, the, the truth is, you can learn some things in general, but it's very, very hard to learn things uh, in, to say X means Y. And the reason it, it is, is because there are many reasons. There are me because the world is just complicated. I wish it wasn't complicated, but the world is complicated. And the fact is that there are actually five different reasons why you might have a, a worn edge of your bowler hat. It might be because you know you always put it up on the car. It might be because you know somebody gave you a worn bowler hat. It might who, who knows what it might be because you know you always sit on the left hand side of the carriage or whatever you had in his days. And you know so there the the thing is there are multiple different reasons why you might have these things. So 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 there so behavior. So so first of all. Objects and things are multiply determined. There are many legitimate reasons why you might have a bowler hat with a worn edge. The other side of the coin is also is that there is that a given trait, say a certain personality trait, whether it whether it's say extroversion or whatever, that can be manifested in many different ways. And so so there isn't there just simply isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between between objects and things. Uh, I wish there was. So what you have to do is you have to do many many of the things that Jim was talking about is you have to build up a um, our research shows build up build up a story piece by piece. So so for example um, if, if you go, so, so our research shows that you can learn a lot about some traits from people by snooping around their stuff. So for example, there, some of the things you can learn about, one of the things you can learn about is, is, a, is a trait known as openness to experience. So this is sort of, do people like to try new things? Do they, are they sort of philosophical and abstract? And do they, do they uh, go on a, uh, exotic adventures? You know, would they, would they go to this sort of the, this uh, avant-garde, a new restaurant that mixes sort of Himalayan Malayan cooking with, um, you know, southern cooking or something like that, or do they want to go to the Olive Garden, right? So which, which, which of those appeals to them? Neither one is better, but people high on openness want the avant-garde, people low on openness want the Olive Garden. Um, and, so, and so it turns out you can learn a lot about this trait from snooping around people's stuff. But it's a great mistake to look at single clues. So, for example, one of the, even even one of the strongest clues, one of the most diagnostic things you, for 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 uh, somebody being high on openness is: do they have original art on the walls? Okay, do they have? But, but even that clue alone doesn't work. You have to combine it with other things. So, if you go into somebody's space, you should look at this thing and say, "Okay, I'm going to build up a theory." So, so this person could be open. But I need to look for other things. And, th and so any single clue can be very, very misleading. So in terms of going into people's spaces, we, we recommend that what you do is, is, is a couple of things. If you, if you want to go be Sherlock Holmes and try and figure out, what, you know, you just meet someone and you, you go on one date with them or something like that, then they go to the bathroom and you have three and a half minutes to run around <laughs> and see if they're crazy. Not, I wouldn't do this, but, but I have friends who would. Um, <laughs> 
And so what? And so what you? And so this is what you do. You need. You first of all, you need. You, what you need to do is you need. Sure, you need to look for certain clues which which sh signal their personalities. But you really need to look for themes. You need to look for themes because this helps you um, remove the the. Uh, uh, the, uh, the possibility that something is there by accident. And one of the biggest mistakes people make when they go into people's spaces is they look for things that are very distinctive. Now, something that is distinctive is doubly bad. So, uh, very, so if you go into somebody's space and you just see something that really sticks out, that, those are really, really dangerous things to look at when you're looking around people's spaces. And, and, and the reason is, as I've said, you want to look for clues. You want to look for themes, things that are consistent. Okay, And so... Distinctive things, by definition, by definition, they are inconsistent with what's there. That, what's, that is what makes them distinctive. Okay? So first of all, they are the worst clues. They're probably the least likely to be telling something. And they're most likely to grab your attention, too. Um, and, and, and one of the, one of the uh, spaces we were looking at in our research was just like this. It was, it was, it was somebody's uh, space, and it was clearly a very responsible person, quite a sort of traditional conservative person, uh, somebody who engages in a lot of civic activity, probably isn't much of a, you know, much of a crazy person, you know, probably quite a calm person. And, so, and, and, and everything in the room said that, right? except over in the corner of the room, there was a blue plastic crate with a whole bunch of drugs paraphernalia in there. There was like a bong and all kinds of <laughs> weird stuff in the room. And of course, I sent my research team in there, and they, and they kind of look around the room and go, boring, boring, but oh, that looks interesting. And they go and look, and they spend ages looking at, looking at, this, uh, at this bong and all that stuff in the corner of the room. Now, they, that stuck out in a way that it would not have stuck out in somebody who is more um, uh, uh, rebellious and sort of less socially conventional. It wouldn't have stuck at that, but it really stuck out in this room, right? And it really stuck out, and so it grabbed their attention, and they weighed it very heavily when they were trying to figure out what this person's like. So it was, it was misleading. Now, I later asked the occupant, because I, I, knew, I knew the occupant, I said, so tell me, what was that doing in the corner of your room? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, I've completely forgot about that. That's because my housemate, she was... Um, uh, she was going on, on travel around the world, and she asked me to look after all of her drug stuff. So being the responsible, kind person she was, she put them all in a crate and put them in the corner. So they did tell you about the person, but not for the reason that, 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 that you thought they did. So, so, so anyway, so that's, that's one of the tips. Be very, very careful about looking at, um, uh, looking at these distinctive clues. So gen generally, um, what is it that you want to do when you go into space? I only have about two minutes, I think. Is that right? How are we doing on time? Yeah, I, I definitely want to leave time for questions because I think that would be most interesting. But uh, um, so I'm just going to spend, a, you know, so sort of tips about what you can do when when you when you're snooping ar around around people's place. It's re it's really um, the 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 idea here is you have to try and think how these things got in this place, right? You have to think of the connection between the person, the person's personality, and what I call the behavioral residue. Okay, and 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 so really there are sort of the three broad ways people leave traces of their personalities in their spaces, right? Two of them are deliberate and one of them is inadvertent. So if, if you think now, so, so, so the first way is what I call identity claims. So these are deliberate statements we make to the world about ourselves. So I see many of you wearing things with, on your t-shirts, right? These are deliberate statements you're making to. You chose to have these things on your t-shirts. You are making deliberate statements to others. You're broadcasting your values. Now, that doesn't mean you're disingenuous. It, so people think, well, because you're doing it deliberately, they're just messing with you. No. People, there's lots of research in psychology that shows that people are happier, healthier, more productive when they can bring others to see them as they see themselves. So that's a lot of what's going on here. Just because pe people have Texas, you probably really do feel strongly about Texas and want to broadcast that others. It's not, you're, not just, you're not just doing that to mess with people. So, so first of all, people deliberately say things about themselves in their spaces. Another thing they do deliberately to their spaces is they try and affect them to make themselves feel a certain way. So for example, the most obvious way, of course, is like playing different sort of music, playing lively music to get yourself excited or relaxing music to help you calm down. But there are many things you people put in their spaces which kind of reflect the sorts of emotions they habitually want to evoke. So 
some, sometimes you go into someone's bathroom and it's sort of, there's lots of brightness and stars and bright, and it's like they want to get up and get going. Other people have a bathroom which is kind of relaxing, there's nice smelly things to put in the bath and candles and, and magazines and books and music and that sort of thing. So you can tell, so, so people are doing things deliberately to their spaces here. They're doing things deliberately to their spaces, but the goal here is not to send a signal to others, it's really to affect how they feel. Now, just because they're not, se not sending signals to others deliberately, that doesn't mean we, we, we can't learn about them. So as a snooper, you can still go in and notice they do this, even though it wasn't intended for you, it was intended for them. So, th so these are sort of what I call thought and feeling regulators. People are regulating their, what they think about and how they feel by affecting the environment in which they live. Those are the two things. The third thing is what I call behavioral residue. Behavioral residue is just the fact that in our spaces we engage in many activities, all kinds of activities, and a subset of those activities, not all of them by any shot, but a subset of those activities leave a physical trace in the world, right? And so, for example, you know, I mean, in olden days, people used to have these things called CDs. You may not have heard of them, right? And, and there, but if you look at somebody's CD, and in olden days, they used to have these things called books, too, right? They're books and CDs. And in olden days, you could go in, and you could look at somebody's CD or book collection and see how organized it was. And how organized it was, right, uh, it doesn't organize itself, right? It, 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 it's, that is a residue. Of, it uh, can only get organized as a result of you organizing it and Con persistently organizing it, right? It doesn't, it doesn't just, I, I did that, I thought, okay, I'm going to be an organized person, I'm going to organize my CD collection, I'm going to be one of those people who has an organized CD collection, and I did, I spent like, you know, a whole afternoon sorting them into genres and alphabetizing them and doing all this stuff, and it was fantastic. I had an organized CD collection for a day, Right? Because you can't just do it once. You have to live that life. You have to live that life. And that's one of the reasons why people's spaces are so informative. They're so informative. If I wanted to try and fool you, fool, fool you about what my personality was like in an interview, I might be able to pull it off. Because I would just have to focus. Really, I'd have to focus and just, just maintain the act for that half hour interview. But it's almost impossible to do in my space. It'd be almost impossible to do because I can't just suddenly change my whole space. Please, you, even if I knew what to do, I, you'd have to, you know, I'd have to organize everything and keep it organized, and I'd have, need to buy new things and throw things out. And, and th these, these spaces become receptacles of persistent and consistent behavior. And that's why they are so valuable when, when trying to w learn what somebody's like. So with that as background, here, uh, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to go into, into, into it in, in any detail, and we can talk about it in the Q&A later if you want. But here, here, here are the three things that you sort of, the procedures you need to do when you go into somebody's space. So you, you'll go in, and of course you'll, you'll look around the space and try and get the themes, as I mentioned earlier. But so go to an ob, so you, you need to ask yourself three questions about any object. So first of all, you need to say, what is that object? What is the thing they have there? That is significant. It is significant that in your, in your office space you have a desk calendar versus the person who doesn't have a desk calendar. Okay, that's a start. You got a desk calendar. That means you had at least aspirations to be organized at some point. <laughs> right? At least that. Right? But then you need to go beyond that, of course. You need to look at the state of it. So what is the object? First question. Second question, what is the state of it? The state of it is very important because that tells you how it's used. So is it a, is it a care? So look at the calendar. Is it meticulously filled out with, with birthdays in blue and appointments in yellow and little stars, meaning various different things? OK, okay that means they're engaging in this. They're really using it and tells you about their behavior. Or, as I've seen in many, many desk calendars bought by people on some deluded day when they think that buying a calendar is going to make them organized, you'll see, oh, it's a calendar which is dust all over and hasn't been used for three years. So the state of it is very important because that tells you how these things uh, are used. It doesn't mean it's not important, that even in the case where it's dusty, at least you know something about their aspirations. You know they at least care about being organized. Many messy offices, people just don't care about it. So there's, there's, there's messes that people care about, messes that people don't care about. Okay, so we have the object, we have its state, and then the next question to 
answer really is the location. The location is really important because that tells you about psychological function. That tells you what the purpose is of this, of this space. One of the best places you can do that is looking at pe the people. If you go into people's office spaces, look at the, at the location of the photographs they have, right? Remember, so photographs can serve a multiple, uh, multiple purposes. They're particularly useful if they happen to have photographs on their desk. So you go in and see if the desk, now where are the photos facing? Right? So you see the death. Are they facing? Are they facing them? Right? Are they facing inwards? Look, here's the, all the family photos and me shaking hands with somebody important. And so then, okay, then it's a, then it's a, it's, a, it's it's for the occupant themselves. In that case, it's it's a uh, like a thought and f feeling regulator. It's, it's make them feel away. They're working away, and then they can oh, there's my wife and puppy and or whatever it is, and they can look at that and I feel better now. That's for them. Okay. So to, or are the photos facing out? Well, then it's for you. Then it's an identity claim. Then it's making a statement. Now, it, again, it doesn't need to be, it doesn't mean this is a disingenuous statement, but what it means is, it, is, is it's, it's serving quite a different function. It's there for other, other people. So those are, the, those are the three things we can do. I'm, I'm happy to talk about lots more, but I definitely want to leave at least a couple of minutes for questions. We have uh, five, and a, five and a half minutes for questions. Uh, so if you have any questions uh, to, to either of us, we will, we will both take. Is that right, Jim? Are you all right with that? So uh, questions for us. Maybe we can try and integrate our approaches. Does anyone have a question? I can, I can repeat them. No, you don't. You're like, when do we go home seems to be the main question. <laughs> anyone have a question? Oh, yeah, there's a question. If you, re if you yell it, I'll, I'll yell it back. Okay. Yes. Okay, the question was, is, it, is, is, is far as Sherlock Holmes, is it unrealistic? And I, I think, well, I think yes and no. I mean, I think a lot of it is realistic in the sense that, that, that objects and their state and location and so on do tell you about the activities and, and potentially characteristics of, of, their, um, of the person who left those traces there. However, I think generally it's very, very unrealistic. I think generally because, because for the reasons I mentioned for the reasons I mentioned earlier, it's because you simply that, that they, they simply don't have enough data to make the inferences they claim to be making. Um, uh, it's it's just I mean each each of the things like in, in the TV show they have Holmes saying oh well I see this going on and blah, you know and I'm making you know, these 15 different assumptions you know uh, uh, you know about this person. Well, you, well, in the TV show, you can make that work. But in reality, that's not true. In reality, you could have ended up with that exact same state of things for many different reasons. And it's true if you think about your own space. If you think about your own space, your own bedroom or your own office or your own whatever, and you look at an object there. I mean, I do this all the time. So I, I study, you know, study people's space. And I, and I look at objects in my space, and I think, look, that, that really would give completely the wrong impression about me. And it would give completely the wrong impression about me because it's there for some silly reason, like, you know, I was going to take it out of the office and I forgot, or blah, blah, blah. So, so, the, 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 so I think it is unrealistic in the sense that the world is much more complicated than, than it would be. And, and it, well, having said that, the right. job of statistics is to understand our world. I, I agree. You, and you go into an environment and you try to understand that person from that environment. But what you're saying is, from one or two very small pieces of information, if there are other ways to attribute a cause to that information, then you can't ascribe what's really going on. So you then have to collect more data, and then you have to question, if I can deduce, or if I can say that this piece of information can only attribute to this result, then I can piece together a picture and an explanation. So you said in the case of the, the bong, so your, your collectors then went in and they homed in straight away to the bong and then they said, this person's a drug user. Mm -hmm. Instead of looking at the general messages that were more representative. So instead of being impartial to their environment, your, your sample was biased because it selected the... Right, but there, but there, but, but there, were, there were 10 possible reasons of course. that could have explained for, that, for that, that, that combination. For that one bong. For that com no, yes. the combination of things. But you, you've also said that that person was fairly stable and calm and... and well, apparently, apparently, from, from, the, from, from the belongings, from the belongings and, around And them. then when you question further that existence of the bong, you then said, okay, well, that bong was not, was attributable to someone else bringing into that space. And it conformed to their personality trait because they were 
conventional and try to please and try to, to help others. Yes? Well, yeah, in that case, that is what happened. I don't think we're not really arguing against each other. We're saying, we, no, we're not. No, we're not. We're saying, can you understand your world? Can you use systems to understand your world? Can we? Well, what I'm saying, my, my perspective is that, sure, it, but, but, the, but the, there are so many parameters that, and the world is so complicated, there's so many different things going on that, that it would be very, very hard to be able to collect enough data to say that this configuration of the organized responsible room and the bong in the blue crate in the corner really means that. Because, there are, because you could have that exact same configuration because um, somebody was cleaning the other room and put it in here, or that this person had just come, just moved into a new room, and in fact, the bong was the thing. Right, there, but, there are 20 different things, but, so all I'm... But if you looked at the sum total of that person's room, you would say, okay, well, this one fact is not representative of all facts. So if you'd have said, let's collect data impartially, you would have said, okay, 90% of the information is saying this person is fairly conventional. One to 10% is saying this person is not conventional. So then, if you then piece all of the information together as a story, you're saying 90% you, of this person is conventional, and then there, there might be some tendency not to be conventional. And that's your worst diagnosis, which is pretty damn close to what the person was. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, is, is you should absolutely do that. You should, you should make a saying, I think this is going on. But that's not how I see Sherlock Holmes working. Sherlock Holmes doesn't come in and say, well, I think there's a 20% chance this happened. And well, that's not he quite says, true. That's this, what he this, did this. do. <laughs> that's exactly what he <laughs> did do. He said, so he saw all these, these weird little characters that people were writing on, on water fountains or whatever. And he said, OK, let's look at them. Let's get enough data to look at these messages. And then he said, OK, well, this figure is standing out. So this, this probably represents E. And then he worked through that. And the way of doing it, the, the probabilities are, well, he could have been wrong at each step. But he knew eventually he was right because the model worked, because he, he abductively pieced the pieces together and built a hole. And that hole was resonant because he could, die, he could translate all of the messages. All right. So although at each step he had a probability of being wrong, he appreciated his probability of being wrong and then could assemble it into a, a truth. Sounds great. <laughs> Any other questions? But I don't think this microphone just... is live now, so if you can make your way yeah. to this mic Go for ahead. a question, uh, you okay. will be richly, rich, richly rewarded if you come here to ask your question. So you've put a barrier to asking questions now. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, in your normal everyday life, when you meet people, do you do this kind of thing? Uh, infer their personalities based on what they do and what their space is like? Yes, I think I do. But I think we, I, if, I don't know if the, who the, was the question directed to me. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I think I th absolutely I do. But I think we all do. Uh, but the thing is, it's so, it's so natural for all of us to do it that we don't notice it most of the time. I think because, and you only, and, and you only notice it when you mess up. So you think you know someone and you go, oh, oh, this person's really interesting. And then you go to their house and you see this like huge collection of moose heads or something like that. You just see something that's a <laughs> And you say, whoa. And so, but the fact that you're sometimes surprised by it, what that does is that indicates that you're doing it all the time. So where, but what I tend to do is where it's more useful to me is knowing the sorts of mistakes that people habitually make. So I know, for example, that, um, you know, our research has showed that people make, systematically they make some wrong inferences about people. And I make those too, but then I will stop myself. I'll say, oh, I, you know, well, I think that person seems like a jerk to me. But I know that we form impressions about whether or not people are jerks on the, on the basis of things that, on the basis of clues that are actually diagnostic of something else. So I try to sort of reel back in the, the, those sorts of things. But I, I, think, I think we all do it. I think how I might be, um, uh, uh, how I might do it differently is, is I'm perhaps more sort of sort of systematic in trying to think about uh, about putting the information together, maybe. Yeah, but I, but I bet you you do it, don't you? No. I guess without even knowing. It. Yeah, I think you. I, I think you. I would do. agree. I think we all are looking at our world and trying to understand our world, and we're all trying to assess what's going on. Who is this person? How do they behave? And 
Without training, I don't know that we do it terribly well. We would tend to have our preconception of what is going on, and that would tend to influence our beliefs. And so you said that you, you always have to check yourself. You have to say, okay, well, I think this guy's a jerk, but I'll give him a little bit of chance to sort of hang himself. So, <laughs> so what we do is we collect information, and then you're trying to inject the fact you're being a slightly, or to some degree, being impartial. Oh, let's collect a little bit more and see if this information substantiates our view. So what you're really doing is you're doing Bayesian statistics. You've got this pre-assumption of what the person is, mm -hmm. and then you're collecting further information to validate your belief. And that's what Sherlock Holmes did. I don't think that we could say that we could be Sherlock Holmes to that degree, because I, I also agree. I don't think you can collect information about people to that level. But we certainly can do it for things for medical testing. We can run a few tests. If you tests can be po positive or negative, they can have false positives, they can have false negatives. It's all probability. But we can say if you get an HIV test, the ch if you do one test, there's quite a high chance it could be a false positive. If you run two or three tests, the chances that it's going to be a false positive go much, much down, further down. So all information is error prone. But by questioning impartially and then by re-questioning, we can validate the information. And we can do that for any process. We can do that for people. We can do that for crimes. As we try to build up more complicated models, that's when it starts to fall down. We can't, you can't look at all of you guys and characterize you all for 50,000 variables. We could characterize you for height and weight, IQ or something like that. You couldn't characterize an individual for a lot of information because that's when the information starts to break down because of the probabilities. But I think we all do it with training. We can do it better. And it is probability. It's not going to be absolute, but it can help us to enrich our lives to a, a more better chance of getting a positive outcome in our lives. Uh, are, we, are we down, Roxanne? Do we have more time? I don't want to keep, people have been very, very good, and I don't want to keep them beyond, beyond the time. It's up to you. You're, you're in charge, Roxanne. That's the room. Yeah, but, that's, but they're just being polite. That's the room. Bring it on. <laughs> I guess my question is, um, so you can, when you're snooping someone's room, you can analyze all that stuff, but mm. if, you never get the chance to like see their room or whatever, but you just see them consistently. Can you make similar inferences from how they dress? Yeah, like there are certain things you can learn, and and I mean this is this is one of the things. Different domains uh, afford information about uh, 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 different cues. So for example, so for example, uh, yeah, you you can learn. So clo clothing uh, tends to. Uh, leave quite a lot of clues. Uh, so, for example, uh, and one, we, we've looked at a number of different traits. One of the things we have looked at is uh, narcissism as well. Uh, well, you can look at narcissism, and, and that and that reveals itself in much much of the ways you might expect it to. As uh, so, narcissists, as as you may know, they uh, they tend to be obsessed with uh, ideas of beauty and their own superiority above others, and how fantastic they are essentially. Um, you know, it's, of course, oh, uh, it, this is over the top of a kind of like a brittle sense of self, but no, nonetheless, that, that's the sort of the view. And, and, and uh, you, we, we find in our research that narcissists tend to be wear, wear more expensive uh, clothes. They tend to be much less likely to wear glasses. They tend to uh, put, be put, have more, more makeup on. In, in females, they tend to show more cleavage, uh, those sorts of things, yeah. But there are lots of clues. Again, though, again, this is all just sort of probabilistic. You think there are the, these signals because there are other reasons why you might not be wearing glasses, like you know you don't have bad vision, for example. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask? Um, so my question is, in terms of when you're analyzing someone's personal space, how many times would you say you have to revisit that place to see and properly assess the characterization of the person? For instance. Um, Monday through Thursday, my room would be a complete and utter mess. Yeah. Friday, I clean. Friday, I do my laundry. Yeah. And Friday, things are set. So, for instance, you show up on Wednesday, and there's this outlier of like all my jackets are on the floor. Mm. Um, it might not then... technically be an outlier, though. No? <laughs> it might represent the norm. Uh oh. <laughs> there's something fundamentally wrong with me. This is what I, did. <laughs> I didn't go that far. I just said it wouldn't be an outlier. Okay. Um, I think, uh, I, th I mean, I think, it, I mean, it depends how, you're, you're right, the more times you do it, the better. And, and it, it is true, right, that, is that somebody could have come into my house the day after I organized my CD collection and get completely wrong. So the, the more, the more, you know, as Jim was saying, the more times you sample, the better. So it's, you know, sampling from, from, from the space too. But one thing to be uh, careful about is I think people aren't very good 
so at judging their, for especially the tidiness of their own spaces. So for example, I, with, with it, so within your space, you have a sort of amount spaces fluctuate, and, and I'm sure it does. But probably, even though you have this fluctuation, the mean is very different. Probably at its tidiest, it's not as tidy as some places, and at its, as its messiest, it's not as messy as some places. And that's because you know part of your personality is, is you can only tolerate a cer certain amount, not only tolerate it, but also pu pull it off. Um, uh, I was, I, I was uh, giving a, um, a, 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 a small graduate class on, on some of this work once, and I was co-teaching with somebody else, and in the, in the course of doing so, I said, oh, well, my, my office is very, very messy. And the person teaching with me said, it's not messy, it's very tidy. And so we said, all right, let's settle it. We'll take the whole class up to my office, and we'll look. And they all went in, and they all looked around, and about a third of the class thought it was you know, scarily organized. You know, a third thought it was, how can you possibly get any work done with all the papers everywhere? And a third thought it was about average. And so, so part of personality is not only the things you do, but how you perceive the world. And it's quite different, difficult to fake those differences. Now, so, but, but getting back to your question, so, so, so that's a sort of general thing. I think you know, we perceive in ourselves more fluctuation than if, if, if you had gone to 20 different spaces you would see. But, um, but if you can go multiple times, that's better. So but generally in your experience in yeah. the studies that you've conducted, how yeah. many times would you revisit those places? I, we normally just send people in once, and we do a pretty, pretty good job. Because, because there's a difference between, a, ti there's, there's a, difference between a, a tidy space and a tidied space. You know? So for example, you know, we often, because it, it, there's, if, I, if I knew somebody was coming to assess my home or my office, there's only so much I could do, right? If I, wanted, if I really wanted to give the impression I was tidy. Because I, I, I don't have the means to like suddenly file and organize everything and alphabetize the books and do, do all of these things. That, so I, I could tidy it up, get rid of some of the surface tidiness, but the structure would be there. And, and, and I bet even when your place is looking um, messy, the, 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 the structure is there. That you have hangers for the jackets. You know, some people wouldn't have done that. They'd have, oh man, I don't have hangers, I'm gonna put five of them on one wiry coat hanger and it's gonna fall off, I always does this, and oh, I must get round to getting some hangers, but I never do because, you know, I'm taking care of the parking ticket I got because of the, you know, oh, anyway. Those, but those if are, we came in five times. My living times, room has no furniture, so <laughs> I don't know what kind of judgment you'd make about me, but uh, okay. we have no time. So uh, normally we do once, but more is better. If we came in five times and we saw your room and, and four of the days it was untidy and one of the days it was tidy, then we would be saying, on average, <laughs> it, was, it was slightly untidy. And that would be a fair representation of the time that it was untidy. Yeah? So we can sample, and as long as that sample is representative of that reality, as long as it's impartial, as long as we haven't chosen to tidy on the day we know it's going to be untidy, it should be representative of a trend. And, and, and we're not, you're not saying, OK, we can use statistics to understand an absolute. You're saying we can understand a trend in you, a tendency in you. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. We should probably make this the last question, because you guys have been very, very patient. Thank you. I'm wondering if uh, Holmes isn't really the wrong case study. Mm -hmm. I mean, he is, uh, we love him so much because he's an archetype. He's someone who can make these little fabulous distinctions between different things and organize them. He's, uh, he's someone who's superhuman in a lot of ways. I, well, one thing is, I think we have to, to say, yes, he's a caricature. However, he was also based on a true character. Joseph Bell was a criminologist. Joseph Bell did help the police. Joseph Bell was also a proponent of ob impartial observation. Oh, certainly. So these tendencies, these abilities, um, can help us to understand our world. They're not perfect. They're going to have a chance of being wrong. But, but by practice, by knowing how to do some of these techniques, we can improve our ability to, to make decisions about the world. And we saw by representation of the cancer data that once you question it and once you look at it, you can build up an understanding from, from relatively small pieces of information as long as you validate that information. I think I agree with you. Holmes is a caricature, but he's, he's a fictitious character based on things that can be done. Conan Doyle was a doctor, um, a medical doctor, and he had experience of Bell, who, who was his archetype. So I think that these, although we may never be able to achieve that level, fictitious level of homes, we can enrich our lives to be able to understand our world, which can affect 
our lives in a positive direction to help us get what we want. Sounded like you were going to say, suggest somebody maybe. Were you going on to? Well, I was, I was going to say that, uh, you know, Holmes actually, you know, he, he's not a real person. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, you know, where the, the situation we're looking at is one that is natural, is artificial and, you know, is, is, it's archetypical for a reason. Yeah. It's set up to show us something. Absolutely. Yeah, and it we, shows and that's, us like how said, we can strive. It. <laughs> it shows us how we can improve understanding. I found that, I must say, when I've consulted with professionals doing that, what is kind of scary is how often they will use films and TV shows as evidence for the validity of what they do. So, I mean, it's, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, I, I'm not joking. Like, going to one, one, one law, law, law enforcement agency, and they're saying, yeah, well, you know, it's really good, like, because did you see that film where Steve Martin, he, he did this, and he did that, and he didn't, and he, see how great this is? And I think, yeah, but that's a movie. Like, like what on earth do you think? Uh, and, I think, and I think this is one of the things that, that is quite dangerous. Because it, because, and as a result of this, they aren't systematically collecting data on when they get it right and when they get it wrong. They're just looking at the positives. Oh, like, oh, I, uh, uh, you know, I got it right, and this is you know, well done, and here, here are the five times I got it right. All right, this, well, how many times did you get it wrong? They don't, and they say, we have no idea. No idea how preconception it idea is, is, is very true. And it works in the other direction as well. So this idea, you know, this, are these people, the criminologists, trained in statistics, are they making impartial observations? That's questionable, and you would have to determine whether they have that background. The, other, the flip side is also becoming a problem as well. So jury selection now, a lot of people on juries have seen NCI, and now, and now they start to believe that these observations from science are absolutely true, and in which case this tends to, to lead to convictions that, that may not be of, of people who are actually guilty because they believe that the data is absolute and, and it's not just indicative and they don't question. So it, it, can, it can go both ways. If you don't understand that all information by its nature has error in it and question whether your observation is due to that error, you can, you can make false conclusions. It's, to understand the world, we have to understand that we only see that, that perception of the world, that perception has an error and by appreciating the error, we can then enrich the probability of making a correct decision, and we don't get to up ourselves that our decisions are absolute. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much.